My name is Dr. Haas, and my first name is Beth, and please feel free to use that. Um, mostly what I do, actually, is I'm a clinician in full-time practice, and I really just am working with the lives of my patients, trying to help um, them live better for themselves and with themselves. So we're going to start today and just try to look at some of the overlap between being manic or hypomanic and being in a state of romantic love, um, both of which are states that can be uh, confusing to distinguish one from the other. Okay, so the state of romantic love is a state of high energy. It's a state of high sexuality. It's intense emotionally. You have poor judgment. You're sleepless. You're disinhibited and you're reckless when you're first in love. Okay. The state of mania is a state of high energy. It's a state of high sexuality and intense emotions where you have poor judgment and you're sleepless and disinhibited and reckless. Okay. So actually, right, the question, is it love or is it mania? is kind of confusing because they both have all of those features in common. Very high energy, intense sexuality and emotionality, changes in the way that you judge things, um, sometimes loss of sleep, disinhibition, and recklessness. Okay? So I'm assuming when I talk to you all that you're fairly familiar with, it, with what it feels like to be manic or to be hypomanic, that you've been through that. Um, but here are the criteria for mania. I mean, it's a state where you feel better about yourself. You can often feel grandiose. You don't need to sleep so much. You're likely to talk a lot. I want to keep talking or keep writing. Your thoughts are racing with wonderful creative ideas and insights into all things. And you're highly distractible. I'm busy with everything. You take on so many projects that when you come down from the mania, often you find that you can't complete them. Um, and importantly, it's a state of pleasure, right, where you have, uh, it can have painful consequences from the pleasure, but you're buying things, you're wanting to be with people, you're having sex more or with more people than you would otherwise. Um, and you may sometimes make decisions that you regret in that context um, sexually. Okay? So I'm assuming, though, that, those are, that, that you have some familiarity with what it feels like to be uh, like that. And I'm going to talk a little bit first about the state of being in love. Okay, now um, romantic love is something that happens to to everyone across all cultures. Um, out of every culture that has ever been studied that had data, there is there are, is a condition known as romantic love. Um, so we think of it actually scientifically as an evolutionarily determined state that helps us reproduce our genes. And I've put on this slide. Um, examples of the delightful reproduction of two cute species of genes, the human and uh, the cheetah, right? to show that that is really what we're trying to do, is to get more copies of ourselves out there. And love is something that helps us to do that. Yeah. Um, when scientists have looked at romantic love, they have been very struck by the similarities in love behavior to steps in the process of mating between animals. Okay. So love and something called courtship attraction in animals have very specific steps. And those steps are that we display ourselves to someone else, and then we make a choice about which of the people that are available we're going to connect to. We have to overcome boundaries to approach that person, particularly if you're shy. Okay. Then we pursue that person, we mate with that person, and then we try to keep them for ourselves. And as I said, that process is known as courtship attraction in animals, um, and it's highly stereotyped. Yeah? And there's some overlap with human behaviors. Yeah? Um, in addition, romantic love is thought of as involving complex behaviors. Right? But these behaviors involve systems that we know something about um, in terms of human behavior and in terms of human biology. And those systems are the systems that allow us to be driven to connect to something, to be attracted to it, and to feel rewarded by it. A system that allows us to attach to another person and feel bonded to them. And a sexual system that allows us to mate with them that in some cases keeps us mated with them. So we think of it as specific behaviors, and we also think of it as particular systems. And I'm just putting this out there at the beginning to sort of introduce a, a research approach or a biological approach to it, but it's also kind of interesting to think about how what we do, how stereotyped it really can be. Right? So these are some of the behaviors that are similar in the process of falling in love. 
um, to processes that exist in animals. And I hope you'll find the next couple of slides a little bit entertaining. Um, first of all, we have elaborate industries and uh, bars and clubs set up for us to display to each other what our attributes are and to try to find mates. Hello? which are very, very similar to the ways that animals kind of display themselves in these kind of courtship rituals. And we have procedures such as the bachelorette where we choose our mate, very similar to the way that men will sort of um, male species such as, as stallions or uh, other lions or rabbits will sort of display their abilities so that they can display themselves to be the best mate. And just as animals have to sort of approach each other in a very specific way in order to get to the mate that they choose, flirting actually has a very stereotyped be, um, sort of set of, of behaviors. If you watch the way that people flirt, there's particular body language that both men and women will use where they'll toss their heads, they will use their eyes to communicate that they're interested and look away when they're no longer interested. They'll use the angle of their shoulders in ways that are very similar. Um, to animals to indicate sort of proximity and their willingness to, to get further involved. Um, and finally, I'm sorry, I've got a call coming in from somebody. Um, what you'll see in humans and also in animals is the way that, that two people will then begin to, begin to move in synchrony. Right? And you'll see this in terms of courtship behaviors in animals before they meet. They'll have very stereotyped fluid typed fluid motions while they'll move back and forth in the same way that humans will kind of move together in synchrony and then move away from each other and then move towards each other again. And if you think of two people in the bar, right, it's the turning back towards the person over and over again that eventually leads to the selection of that person as your partner. So the point here is that there's a tremendous amount of overlap between the way that animals connect to their chosen mate and the way that people connect to their chosen mate. And we call this process courtship attraction, and it has a particular script that we think is very important in, in love. Yeah. So um, this is just a kind of funny slide, but the point of this slide is that animals have evolved a tremendous number of ways of replicating their genes. And those behaviors um, are things that we're beginning to see parallels to in terms of human genetics um, that help us understand something about the ways that people partner up. Um, you know, some animals, very few animals actually, are monogamous birds and uh, some species like coyotes. Right? But there are other animals as well. Penguins, for example, show a pattern of serial monogamy, which is something that you'll see in people where they have a different female partner every year. Dolphins are fantastically promiscuous and hedonistic. They will mate with um, other species. They will mate with objects. They will uh, have both uh, homosexual and heterosexual behaviors. They're very, very sort of promiscuous and hedonistic in their, in their style, which sort of suggests that they're willing to spread their genes any which way they can, right? whereas monogamous species are willing to invest only in one other person and try to concentrate their genes there. Um, bees are, are fantastically promiscuous also, but in a very different way. The queen bee mates with 20 different drones in the middle of the air once, and she connects, collects all of the sperm that she's ever going to need during her life and goes back to the hive, and she produces bees from that supply of sperm for the rest of her life. So that's a kind of model where there's an intense concentration of genes that's then spread out over many others. Yeah. And lions are somewhat similar. They mate about 200 times in a two-day span every three years. So they're investing in one offspring from a female lion, and that offspring, they want to get it right. right? So they, they put all of their sperm in one place very intensely, and they hope that they get that right as opposed to spreading it around. And more recently, people have been very entertained by the model of the blackbird. Um, female blackbirds are notorious cheaters. They act uh, very monogamous, and they, act, they stay in their nest, and they have a male that they're tightly bonded to who guards their territory. But when you study the eggs of female blackbirds, you discover that there's actually genes for many other males that are local males. Right? 
So surreptitiously, they're actually getting other genes to kind of enrich their gene pool and give them chances of better recombination on the side. Right? So there are many, many strategies for falling in love and, and getting your genes healthy by combining them with other genes and, and um, making sure that you've got a good, good selection to choose from. And that's really the point of this. But there are many strategies for love that have analogies in the, in the human arena. Right? So, so these are the ways that we start to think about uh, romantic love in, in the world of, of science. Um, and there are basically three research approaches to love. Yeah? The first is one that we just discussed. Love is a form of courtship attraction, similar to the animal model of, of courtship attraction. The second model for understanding love is that it's uh, like addiction, right? because there are many qualities of love that are similar to addiction. It's an intensely motivated state to be in love. You obsess over and you crave your lover. Um, and it's, it's very reward-driven. Yeah? And that is something that overlaps with mania. Mania is a very active, driven state, although usually not as obsessively focused on one thing, but rather spread out over other things. And finally, there's this behavioral systems model, which I talked about a minute ago, which says that love is a set of complex behaviors, and we want to look at the systems that are involved in that, attachment, sex, and, and caregiving. And so let's talk a little bit more about each of those. Yeah. Um, one thing that I find very poignant, actually, is the way that the pattern of love that we learn as little babies um, is something that is repeated very much in the animal world, but also in adult humans. And if you think about infant love and also adult love, um, the way that they bond to each other is quite similar. So look at this list of the qualities of infant love and adult love that overlap. Mm -hmm. Your bond depends on the person being interested and reciprocating your affection. Babies whose mothers do not respond go into a state of despair and hopelessness. When you feel bonded to your lover, you feel safe and confident. Your world sort of expands and you feel joyful. When you're rejected, there's a state of preoccupation. Babies will get very preoccupied with, where is my mother? Where is my mother? They'll seek her out. They'll bang on the door that she went out of. They'll show an intense separation anxiety. And the same is true when you're in love with somebody. If they don't return your text or if they don't call you back, your anxiety level shoots up and you become preoccupied with reaching them. Yeah? The behaviors of, of infant attachment and the um, mother and baby or father and baby are very similar to the behaviors of love. There's a lot of touching, caressing, kissing, clinging kind of behavior. Um, there's a state of grief that occurs when, with separation also. There's a lot of distress and there can be a state of despair and hopelessness. Infants will actually die if they're separated long enough from their babies, as I'm sure you're aware. And when you re reunite with your lover, there's this sort of happy vocalizing and gesturing of how, how delighted you are to reconnect. Um, when you're in love, you will do what a baby does in sharing everything about yourself with mommy. If you think about babies running back and forth, bringing things to each other, it's very similar the way that, to the way that lovers will want to share everything about themselves. Um, there's a particular tendency to, to, to gaze at each other to look at each other the way that, that a baby will gaze and gaze into its mother's face and the mother will gaze back, father also obviously, um, to be fascinated with taking in um, uh, what you see in the eyes of the other person and what's on their face, their emotions. Um, that, and with that comes, I'm skipping one, um, a state of sort of mind reading or mirroring where you feel really super connected um, to the other person. And that is something that is very similar to a quality of mania where you feel that you can sort of connect with other people and read what's going on in a heightened way. Um, there's also a distortion of judgment occurs that when you're very closely bonded to somebody, you just ignore their negative qualities. <clears throat> And infants are actually able to ignore their mothers quite intensely. Uh, when their mothers are doing something wrong, they're very good at sort of looking away and downplaying that. And infants are also very good at connecting to the positive attributes of their mothers, so that if mothers are only responsive part of the time, about 40% of the time, the infant will have a good secure bond with her, even if she's busy or distracted the other 60% of the time. So there's a capacity to ignore what isn't going well and focus on the other person's best qualities and also to work hard for them to try to get their approval. Um, so see, these are some of the behaviors that are very similar in the process of infant attachment and adult attachment in terms of love. And this is where we get the attachment model of love. Um, 
another way to think about love is, as I said, as, a, as an addiction um, that um, there's a tremendous amount in common because of the obsessive nature of pursuing the beloved. Um, this is very similar to the obsessive nature of pursuing a drug, which is kind of stalking for the desired person and thinking always about the desired person or drug. And that craving, the craving that you have for them, um, causes you to think differently and to ignore rules. Lovers will, you know, tap on their, their girlfriend's uh, window in the middle of the night to get to her. Uh, they will anger her father in order to get to her, these kinds of behaviors. Um, so there's a craving for the person that is similar to the craving that you feel for a drug. Um, and you're willing to break rules and take risks and do things that you would usually not do. You're willing to cross boundaries that you would usually not cross in going up and speaking with somebody or feeling that you have to tell them something about yourself or challenge something. Um, and similarly to the way that, that drugs can make us think uh, things that turn out not to be so true, like it's okay to be late for work, for example, um, lovers can make us feel that uh, we don't have to pay as much attention to reality. Right, that because we're so in love, we don't need to worry about our job as much as we would, um, for example. Yeah. So that's some of the ways that romantic love resembles addiction. Yeah. But romantic love is, is really a human state. It's uniquely human, and it has these mental qualities that allow us to feel a connected connection to one person that I just want to emphasize. When you are in love, not only are you deeply in love with the other person, but your own self-esteem goes up a lot. And that's something that is similar to mania also, that you are, in feeling understood and connected, you feel better about yourself. And one of the uh, researchers in love, Dr. Aaron, feels that this quality of feeling, your self-esteem shoot up, um, is the actual core quality that defines passionate love as much as you're in love with the other person, that it's really your sense of being special and admired and valued that is what is the most important to people in, in, in being in love. Your ability to read them and them, their ability to read you is also enhanced. There's this intense awareness. Thing. Um, so there's increased self and other awareness, which we think has something to do with the mirror neuron system. There's this feeling of being able to connect and be understood, which we also think has to do with the mirror neuron system. And then there's the sense of being special because of that connection. And along with that, your self-esteem goes up. At the same time, there's this real preoccupation and worry about that connection on the other, other hand, right? Lovers are intensely rejection sensitive. They are intensely obsessive and they're intensely anxious about separation. So those are sort of the mental qualities of romantic love. Yeah. Ashley, anything that we should pause for at this point? Um, we're, go we're doing good. Um, the other thing that I want to... Yeah? No, go ahead. We're doing good. Thank you. Okay, okay. So um, the physical features of romantic love are also a bit important because it is based in adrenaline. There is, is tremendous excitement that goes on with being in love. And I want you to think about this in terms of adrenaline and mania, right? what, um, for example, speed does to somebody who's bipolar. Right? That um, The state of romantic love in, is an involuntary state. It switches on, right? sometimes like a lightning bolt. It's not something that you can usually control when you're in love with somebody, in the same way that mania is something that switches on. Um, and with it comes a lot of physical arousal in both cases, increased energy, increased drive, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate. Um, you know, lovers have clammy palms, their hearts are racing when they're close to each other. There's this intense um, sympathetic system, you know, the fight and flight system arousal that goes along with being in love. And that may be one of the things that love and mania have in common, actually, is this, this uh, excitement based in adrenaline, so the chemistry of which is changed in mania. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I have to say, I think, about love. Yeah. And now let's begin to think about some of the comparisons and some of the scientific features of mania. Yeah. Um, what love and mania have in common is, interestingly, things that have to do a lot with the fact that they're episodic. Right, that they are switched on and switched off. And I'm going to be emphasizing this in terms of the clock genes, the genes that regulate our circadian rhythms. Yeah. So both love and mania are things that have their onset in late adolescence. 
right? You fall in love when you're 17, 16, 20 maybe, even though you might have crushes before, they're not usually as intensely sexual. And similarly, mania tends to start or bipolarity, often with an episode of depression, but bipolarity will start in late adolescence or young, young adulthood. It's a disease that switches on at a certain point. Um, both of them are episodic things. We think that romantic love actually has kind of a lifespan. For most people, that's between a year and a half and three years that they stay that they were intensely in love and really preoccupied with the person. And usually that fades into a different kind of love called companionate love, which is a more stable kind of long-term love. Um, but the intense phase of romantic love persists for really very few people. Pieces of it may persist, but not most people are not intensely romantically in love for more than a few years. Um, so it's an episodic thing, just like uh, bipolarity. Um, as I said, it's, it's involuntary. You can't really control it. Um, and there's a question as to whether they're both seasonal, which I'm going to talk about um, more in a bit. But as you know, that, that mania is something that's very res responsive to light, and mania tends to have seasons. People's symptoms are most active um, between May and June and between November and December. So there's this um, seasonal pattern to being bipolar. And people can have all different seasonal patterns. It's, that's quite variable, actually. But there is most commonly the, the pattern of being most active in terms of your symptoms in the spring and around Christmas. Um, and the same thing is maybe true of love. That's, that's not quite so true of love. But there is an evidence that teenagers are most likely to sort of um, initiate some kinds of love in the spring. And actually, interestingly, a more monogamous kind of love uh, around Christmas time is, is most common. Um, and both of them mediate changes in, in sex behavior, reproductive behavior. Right? So they both get you to approach other people more and choose more lovers and do things that have to do with social affiliation and sex. Right? So we're, we're interested in the fact that it's an episodic uh, kind of thing uh, to be in love and to have bipolar disorder and what that might say about what they have in common. Okay. Okay, so if we put all this together, okay, we can say something about the relationship between love and mania. That, that um, sorry, let me mark my hair clean up here. So this is actually sorry, um, so this is actually sort of a slide about the chemistry of being in love, and um, we're going to look at what the chemicals are that are similar to mania. So um, we think that dopamine is an important chemical in falling in love that it gives you that feeling of euphoria, a kind of a drug-induced high that makes you believe in your lover and believe in yourself. And I'll show you some of the evidence for that in a second. We think that adrenaline, as I said, is responsible for the, sort of the excitement of love, that it helps you um, it, it helps you control stress. It helps you manage stress by raising your heart rate and your blood pressure, but it also causes racing heart and sweaty palms and makes you more alert and attentive and more excited about pursuing things. And then serotonin is a chemical that is also important in um, mostly in the attachment side of love. If you think about ecstasy, um, people on ecstasy think that the person that they're with is the greatest thing ever, and they want to touch that person for whatever the, the duration of action of ecstasy is. Um, and that is a serotonin-releasing drug. So when serotonin is released, we feel safe and secure and close, and we want to touch other people. We feel connected to them. So we think that those are chemicals that are involved in the attraction phase of love. Right? And then over time, that attraction phase has to be switched into a longer-term attachment. Right? And probably each of those chemicals is also important in terms of attachment. Um, but we also think that oxytocin in, in particular and vasopressin to a certain extent are important in attachment. I don't know if people are familiar with the story of the uh, prairie vole, um, but this, this knowledge really came from studying prairie voles. And there's a, a mountain prairie vole. He lives up high in the hills who is very promiscuous. He has many, many lovers. And there is a uh, valley prairie vole bull, bull, who's genetically different, who is extremely monogamous, one of the most monogamous animals that we know about. And it turns out that those, uh, those voles have different genes for oxytocin and vasopressin. And that if you switch the mountain vole um, and give him the prairie voles, uh, valley voles um, gene for the uh, vasopressin receptor, that the mountain vole will stop being promiscuous and will start being monogamous. Um, and that um, 
interestingly, has recently been found in human males as well, that there are variations of this receptor, and that men who have the variation that is most similar to the promiscuous vole do poorly in marriages. They tend to have more lovers over time, and they have more difficulty being monogamous. So we think that there actually may be some sort of promiscu promiscuous versus monogamous genes that can influence human behavior as well. Okay, so that's sort of the biology of love. Okay, let's get this one. I'm going to tell you a little bit now about what brains look like when they're in love and in their manic and when they're manic, and see if we see any similarities there. Okay. Um, this work really comes from the lab of Helen Fisher and Lucy Brown, um, and what they wanted to understand is what is it about the brain in love? What does it look like? What lights up? And what they studied was they put people in an MRI machine, and they had them think about the person that they love, and that is the husband of one of them on the left, a dearly beloved person, and a friend on the right, there in that slide over here. Um, and that they would have the person look at the friend, and then look at the beloved, and then look back at the friend, and look at the beloved, and measure which parts of the brain were different when looking at the person that you're in love with. And in between, you would have to count backwards from 1,689 by sevens. And that will clear up any overlap between the two because you get very distracted when you do that. Yeah. So what they saw was that the things that are different when you're looking at the person that you're in love with are here. Um, I don't know if you guys have looked at a slide like this before, but this is the human brain in cross-section. And the nose and the front and the eyeball are on the left. And the... Um, back of the brain, the back of your skull is on the right, and we're looking at the very deep structures of the brain, the parts that are regulating our mood and our appetite and our sex drive and our breathing and these kinds of things. So, so appetitive uh, sections of the human brain are shown here in the middle where the red areas are, that core up and down. Um, what they found was that the parts of the brain that are important when you are looking at the face of somebody that you love are the ventral tegmental area, otherwise known as the VTA. And this is an area that um, is important for reward. Right? It lights up also with uh, drug abuse um, for when you're craving something. But it's an area that's associated with the sense of pleasure and reward, and I like this, right? the VTA. And then the striatum, which is an area that is, is responsible for um, attachment, I think. Well, let me just get to that next. Yeah. Um, Okay, so these are the two areas that are unique when you uh, are looking at somebody that you, that you love. And what they next sort of saw was that there seems to be a sequential pattern of activation, um, that there are nuclei that are listed, um, nuclei being pieces of the brain that are connected to each other, and that they're kind of in sequence, right? and that there's a pattern, um, a, a sequential um, by, um, anatomic sequence where the piece of the brain that is responsible for attraction and the feeling of reward when you were with somebody is right next to the part that's most active in terms of libido and sexual drive and that that is actually in proximity to the section that's most active in terms of attachment and bonding, the part that we talked about with the prairie vole. So that there seems to be actually a whole sequence of little groups of nerve cells that we are going to start looking for the connections between that help us to be attracted and then have sex and then attach so that one set of cells can so send signals to the next and they can um, uh, send, set up patterns um, that allow us to think and feel a certain way. Okay. And if you look at this, this is a picture of the, that same brain in cross-section like um, from the front as if I, I sort of sliced you uh, cross-section looking at you from the front. And all I want to show you here is that lust is in yellow. Romance or that feeling of romantic love is in red. And attachment areas of the, the brain that are involved in bonding are in green. And this is sort of supposed to show that there is sort of a sequence of these things. You've got you know, them very, very much close together in the brain. Um, and we're beginning to tease apart how and what the connections are, but they're sort of linked one next to the other. Okay, so this is the picture of one person's uh, experience in the scanner that I showed you. Um, and this is what one brain looks like in love. These are the parts that light up. And you will see in the back of the brain, there's a lot of activity. And that's the visual cortex, the looking at part. 
um, and then there's some places um, that are less relevant on the bottom, and then there are these two centers that have to do with reward, that have the two arrows on them. There's another part in the front part of your brain, the more thinking and complex planning part of your brain, that also lights up in, when you're thinking about how to get the things that you crave. Right? So these are the um, areas of the brain in love that overlap with areas that light up in somebody who is manic. Um, and these are reward-dependent areas. Um, and so that's what that slide shows. So there's an overlap then between love and mania in the sense of reward dependence is activated in both. Yeah? However, right, this is a picture that shows um, the areas in a whole bunch of people with bipolar disorder that are most active. And I want you to hopefully see that these are not the same areas that we were looking at before. Right? If I go back to the black wings, if you look at the little black wings on the top left corner here, you'll see that not the whole area is lit up around the edges. And if I go back a couple of slides to the parts that are important for love, you'll see there's a lot of activity right around those black wings. Yeah. But most importantly, there's this big red area in the brains of people that are bipolar, which is, is more active. Um, and some of it is very active, um, which is shown in, um, um, so that 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 area is quite different than somebody who's in love. And that area has to do with the regulation of emotion. Um, and we think that that's a very important area for bipolarity. And there's also a frontal area, the big purple area in the bottom left. Right? And that area has to do with uh, planning and execution of tasks, which we think has to do with the change of judgment that comes when you're, you're uh, bipolar, that you're judging things differently in terms of what you should do and how you should do it. This is just another picture showing kind of the same thing. And then just what I want to emphasize is the little black wings are not lit up. And that there are areas that are lit up here that are not at all lit up. This is a meta-analysis of all the studies of brains in bipolar people that shows the areas that are most different in bipolarity. And that's, that's all I want to say about it. Okay, So in sum, the brains of people who are in love and the people who are manic are most similar in areas of the brain associated with seeking pleasure and reward, including sexual pleasure and, um, and bonding behaviors that, that lead you to seek new mates and attach to other people. Okay, and I've gone over some of the chemistry. And we think that love and mania are both dopamine and epinephrine-mediated states of increased arousal and drive. Skip some stuff here that has to do with the relationship between seasonality um, and, and mania. And go to the comparison between the two. Because um, we want to talk clinically now about what is the same and what is different. So to make a comparison between what you're like when you're in love and what you're like when you're manic. Right? When you're in love, your emotionality, your affect towards what we say in psychiatry, is increased. And it's increased in mania too. You are more emotional in both states. Yeah? You tend to be euphoric when you're in love, but you can also be testy and irritable uh, when you're in love. But in mania, you're likely to be euphoric, but you're more likely to be irritable if you're manic than if you're in love. Yeah? In both states, your libido is increased. Your sex drive is increased when you're in love and increased when you're manic. Although, interestingly, sex drive is not actually that important for the, the thought process of romantic love. It's not so much about that. Um, there's some people who can be deeply in love and not have sex, for instance. Right? Um, you are more impulsive when you're in love and you are more impulsive when you're manic. You take more risks in both states. Your energy is increased in both states and your self-esteem is increased in both states. I don't know if anybody has had the experience of when they're manic wanting to take off their clothes or wear eye-catching behavior, but that's something that is seen quite commonly when you're manic is that you want to sort of be more exhibitionistic um, and be more dramatic in your dress. Um, and that's something that is also increased in love. You want to display yourself. You want to be beautiful and eye-catching. Both of them involve a sense of being connected to the other person. And in both of them, there is a change in your sense of certainty, right? That you feel very, very certain of what you think and feel. You're certain that you're in love. You're certain that everything is going your way when you're manic. Um, in both of them, your, your ability to perceive things, to notice the details of the other person is really high. One of the most striking things about people that are hypomanic is how, how incredibly 
smart they are and attuned to their perceptions. And that's also true when you're in love, except it's all focused on your lover, um, that you can notice the smallest details of their hair and their eyes and their skin and everything about them. And both of them are slightly paranoid states in the sense that you can flip very quickly into being into guarding something that you care about. Uh, manic people can be worried about something going wrong with their plans, and lovers can be worried about something going on with their lover. Okay? The differences between them, though, are, are going to be important for us in our questions. So um, what are the differences? Right? Um, the differences are that when you're in love, you're more likely to be monogamous. And sexuality, in particular, in mania, is not usually monogamous. It can be. There are certain people that when they are manic or hypomanic, the first thing that will happen is that they'll fall in love with one individual, get preoccupied with one person. But more often, if you're hypersexual when you're manic, you want to have a bunch of lovers. You want to experiment. You want to do all sorts of new things. And the word for psychiatry in psychiatry that we use is polymorphous, meaning many, many options, many, many changes. Um, when you are in love, your attachment is to one specific person. That's what you're focused on. And in mania, the kind of thinking that you're thinking about is universal. You feel connected to the universe. And you feel connected to the stars and to greater things. Your sleep when you're in love is more likely to be normal. You can be sleepless, but it's much more likely to be normal, whereas loss of sleep is something that is classic for bipolarity. And your attention when you're in love is focused, whereas when you're manic, it's more likely to be distracted and focused all over the place, as I've said. Your, your thought process when you're manic is expanding all over the place. Your thoughts are everywhere, whereas with, with love, you're obsessive. Um, and when you're manic, you're more, not likely to be paying attention to yourself. When you're in love, you're a little bit more likely to be self-aware and to be at a normal pace in your thoughts where you're going to be racing when you're manic. Um, jealousy is more common in love than in mania, though it can happen. Um, in mania, you can have erotomanic uh, delusions where you feel preoccupied with one person and jealous about them. But most commonly in love, you're going to be jealous. And in, in love, you're going to be very attuned to social cues and what does this person want you to do and how should you behave and how can you get their attention. Whereas in mania, you're not likely to be all that thinking about or worried about them socially, what are people thinking about you? Because you're going to be feeling so good that you're going to be just kind of ignoring things that you might worry about. Um, and the sense of certainty is a little bit different, although both states are very certain, ta certain states. Um, in mania, you're not going to be uh, um, as, as able to test things and be as certain of them because you're going to be going so quickly. Whereas lovers were a little bit more able to sort of have doubts and to see the rejection and see the, ch the challenges and see things that are not going well and to worry about them. So those are sort of the differences between the two. So that's what I wanted to present to you. Um, and now I thought I would you know, take questions. And um, the next two slides, if you want, I can show you a scale that you can use for evaluating um, whether you're in love or whether you're hypomanic. And we can talk about some case examples, if you'd like, so we can get to that. So we'll stay here with the differences between being love and manic, and I can take some questions and give you some of my thoughts about how you can sort one out from the other. Thank you so much. Um, our first question is, how do you know that you were in the attachment phase or the attraction phase of a relationship? Okay, that's a really, um, a really great <laughs> question. Those those phases overlap. Um, the attraction phase is really more about feeling turned on by somebody, reading them physically. Um, the attachment phase is more about the obsessive thinking about them. So if you look on this passionate love scale, um, and you say, look at number two, three, four. Five is, um, I can't control my thoughts about this person. I'd rather be with this person than anybody else. I want to know all about this person. I'll love them forever. I have an en endless appetite for this one person. Those are attachment-mediated um, behaviors, um, whereas attraction is like, you know, he's cute, she's cute. I want to be with her physically, right? But it's really more about the more lustful aspects. Um, will the, someone would like to know if these slides will be available? Um, I'm happy to make them available. Yeah, that'd be no problem. Okay, and should they email you directly? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you think hypomania or mania is responsible for limerence, assuming you believe in it? 
Um, that is a very, again, these are really advanced questions. It's really wonderful. Um, um, you know, limerence is sort of another word for the state of love. Um, and um, what I would say about it is the following. Um, first of all, we actually don't know that there is an overlap in terms of research between either state of hypomania or mania and the state of romantic love. But we do know that there are some people, for example, um, and you may all know of Dr. Kay Jamison, who writes about um, bipolarity, is writing a book right now on Robert Lowell. Um, he would fall in love as the first state of his first sign of his manias. And this would most definitely be a state of limerence because it would be intense romantic love. Um, and, um, and then that would very, very quickly uh, evolve into a real agitated mania where he'd be very, very violent and need to be admitted to the hospital. And he would, in the process, uh, initiate divorce proceedings and, and take a lot of other action based on this experience of love, which for him went very, very quickly from love to mania. However, in terms of um, what we know about where sexual behaviors change in terms of flirting and um, uh, where there may be a little bit more love behavior, it may actually be more closely connected to hypomania. But that is um, really not a, an established fact. There's some very soft suggestions in the literature on sexuality and bipolarity that it is um, bipolar two people who are hypomanic, who show more flexibility in their love states and romantic and sexual states than bipolar one people. But again, that is highly preliminary, kind of not at all clear yet. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting question. I think um, I think that the, the question about the relationship between limerence and, and bipolar one or two really comes down to the way that you, you shift the way you're thinking, right? the way your sense of what you judge to be important changes. And that is certainly on a spectrum between hypomania and mania. Um, and in, in that sense, I would say that, that limerence is probably a little bit closer to hypomania in the sense that you're still checking in um, with other aspects of reality much more often. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any advice on dealing with a bipolar spouse who vacillates between mania, romantic love, and depression, yet refuses to take their medication? I'm sorry, I missed a couple of words with the with the bell. Uh, bipolar spouse who what? Can you hear me? Yep, but I missed a couple of words. There was a bell in the background. Um, do you have any advice on dealing with a bipolar spouse who vacillates between mania, uh -huh. romantic, mania, romantic mm -hmm. love, and depression, yet refuses to take medication? Well, does this person want to give a little bit more insight into where where things start to get difficult? What what is this the person that doesn't want to take meds refusing based on? Um, any arguments end in wanting a divorce. Mm -hmm. So I believe that they are just asking how any advice on how to deal with someone who. Um, is swinging, you know, from different types of depression, mania, romantic love, um, but doesn't want to take their medication to be more stable. Yeah, I mean, I think that you want to strike while the iron is cold in that circumstance, you know. And so what I would start to do is to collect information from that person in different states, right? So you can have them, you know, ask them to write down what they most you know, value in love when they're depressed and then ask them to write down what they most, you know, talk to them about it or make an email or make a little letter or something. What do they really love, you know, think is the best mate for them or what is important to them in love at different time points when they're up, when they're down, and when they're in between. And then hopefully you can use that to kind of help them see that there are inconsistencies in those three things and that the, the kind of partner that they're wanting to have is changing a lot and that may help them to realize that there's something shifting. Um, you know, um, and particularly when things are more chill, you want to draw their attention to what is going on when they're manic and how they always fall in love with somebody else and, um, and ask them what it is that is so important 
to them about that that they will not give it up because usually when somebody is refusing to take meds, there's something that's so profoundly important to them. It's that the experience of love or the experience of mania that it's hard to imagine giving it up. Um, I would also really try to in- engage the person's doctor in, uh, if they have any any physician at all, even their family physician, um, because often when a family physician says, you know, what, what are you willing to do for this relationship? You know, are you willing to consider some things that can be taken a little bit more seriously than than when a spouse brings it up? Um, Thank you. Uh, the next question is, since both love and mania are involuntary, what role does individual willpower play? Um, it plays, a, it plays a, a role when you have prepared yourself for it. So as I said, what you want to do is you want to work on these things when you're not in a state of hypomania or depression um, and really sort of try to prepare what you think is uh, important to you in, in love at that time, you know, and engage your friends and your family in knowing about that. Um, so when you think about what is of value to you when you're in a, in a euthymic state, when you're not either up or down, then you can sort of carry that forward a little bit more easily. I think that, you know, I had a young woman who really deeply uh, loved her husband and she kept having these um, affairs and it, it was very, very distressing to her, and it told, took her five years to tell me that this was going on. And she said that you know she had absolutely no control over it at all. Um, and you know she just it, she would just this switch would just go off, and she would stop thinking entirely. And it was really only when she began to see that this only happened in the springtime um, that she was really like, okay, so this is then it's a springtime symptom for me, and then she could really keep control of it. So now, whenever it's springtime, a she doesn't put herself in those situations anymore where she's you know yeah. drinking more at the party or something like that, and and b she. When it happens in the spring, she's like, oh, it's spring, it must be one of those, right? So that she's able to use the insight that she prepared from before um, to help her make better decisions. Um, so even then when that switch goes off, she can ignore it a little bit, um, whereas before she really felt that she couldn't. And so she's developed sort of new brain muscles that go off at the same time as the switch, um, and that helps her. Thank you. Can you please expand a little bit on the seasonal differences, especially those um, who have seasonal affective disorder? Um, the seasonal differences in, in manic symptoms or in, in... In manic symptoms. In manic symptoms, yeah. Um, I think I don't actually have a slide that would be useful for that. Um, so... You know, people are, are, there's very clearly some people who have seasonal di- affective disorder, and that is typically a winter depression and then a spring or summer um, uh, hypomania. That's about 20% of manic people that will have that classic seasonal pattern of winter depression and, and summer uh, elevation of mood. But up to 40% of people that are bipolar will have a very distinct seasonal pattern. It might be the opposite in some way that they're that they're depressed in the summer and they're more up at winter time. Um, overall, you know, um, what we know is that it's not so much that one particular state of mania or depression occurs in a particular season. So it's not like every spring you're going to be manic and every winter you're going to be depressed. But that symptoms in general are most increased around April, May, June, and November, December, really May is really the peak month for this. And that is correlated to a month or two after the light starts to change or as the light is breaking um, and people are exposed to more light because we know that that we think that mania is very much a disorder that is related to circadian rhythms and the clock that the brain uh, has that turns on and off in response to day and night. Um, So what you see is that in May, that there is an increase in suicidal behavior, there's an increase in manic states, there's an increase in mixed states in particular, um, and that psychiatric admissions go up in May for bipolar people. Um, I personally leave extra sessions in May because a lot of the times my bipolar patients are going to start coming in then, even if they haven't been in for a while. Um, so I just leave a few sessions open for that in the month. 
Um, and, you know, emergency rooms know this to be the case as well, um, that they're going to need extra resources for that uh, for that population of, of people in, in the spring. It's just a very activated time. But the activation is not so much in a specific set of symptoms, but is in any possible symptom can be more at that time. And the same thing is true uh, sort of late November to mid-December. You'll see an increase in symptoms in general. It's a little bit more tilted towards the depressions, but not necessarily. I mean, I have had many patients for whom it was a mania at Christmas time um, pretty consistently. So um, that's what I would say about it. Thank you. Could you restate how long you think intense romantic love lasts and what is the name of the next stage? Um, the research is that it lasts about 18 months in, some, in a couple studies and three years in others. So usually about a year and a half to three, it sort of starts to fade and by three years for most people it seems to be over. That's not completely clear yet, but it, but it seems to be that way. Okay, thank you. When you begin to date a person and feel that, that you are about to get pretty serious. Um, when do you recommend telling them that you are bipolar and how? Oh gosh, I get this question all the time and, I, and obviously I can't give one one particular answer. Um, you know, what I would say is if you're really seriously thinking of dating somebody and being with them for the long term in any way, right, then that means you are trusting this person to love you and to be an available partner. And they're going to have to be an available partner to the whole person that you are. And there is uh, nothing worse for a relationship than being betrayed. And if you don't tell something very important about yourself, no matter what it is, you are setting yourself up for the person to you know, feel that they've been betrayed in, in getting to know you. And the other person is you want to, the thing is you want to be loved for who you are. So if you can't tell them that, you know, what, it, what else can't you tell them? Right? So I'm in general a fan of telling people um, as soon as you feel that this is a relationship that is going to be steady for a period of time. Um, you know, this is an illness. There's no reason to be ashamed of it. And if this is somebody who has significant stigma about mental illness, that they're going to change their opinion of you dramatically, the earlier you know that, the better. Um, and the more, you know, the more that you know that they're open-minded and tolerant, the, the the easier you're going to, you know, decide if this is somebody who's going to be right for you. So I tend to say, you know, tell them as soon as you can possibly begin to think about the question. Um, yeah. Thank you. Does any part of the brain connect with homosexuality? Our son who is taking clozapin is manic and seeks male partners who are needy, violent, and abusive. Um, well, did he only do that when he's manic? I'm just waiting for her to respond. Yeah. Um, so the answer to that is that, you know, in the part of the brain that I showed you, uh, with that core section of the brain are many small groups of cells called nuclei, which are, um, responsible for sexual behavior. And when you trigger those nuclei, people will feel sexual or they'll do things that are associated with sex, um, show signs of arousal. Um, and that there are nuclei that are they're very, very different in men and women. They have um, they bind testosterone much, much more in men than in women, for example. And that there has been some evidence that one of those nuclei is a different size and has different binding in men who are gay than men who are straight. And that's been one of the most important findings in terms of homosexuality being uh, at least you know, predominantly a biological uh, situation. And so the answer to that is yes. The other thing I would say is or the, the question was, can mania make someone have homosexual behavior? Uh, yes, and she said not all the times, but it is worse at certain seasons. Worse at certain worse at certain seasons in terms of being more involved with people that are abusive of him. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know what I would say is again that that what we're activating in, when is we're activating parts of the brain that are involved in attachment, are involved in lust, and that one one can be painfully attached as well as lovingly attached to people. Um, and that, you know, 
that that we think that um, the sexuality of people that are bipolar is a little bit more flexible and fluid and diverse in the same way that bipolar people are more flexible and fluid and diverse um, in in their um, activated you know expansive uh, sort of novelty seeking state of being up um, so I don't know if that answers the question particularly, but um, yes, there can be changes in sexuality that are state dependent, and there can be changes in attachment that are state dependent, um, and there's certainly more seeking of new and different activities in people that are in hypomanic or manic states. Um, and that there can be a driven quality for it as well. Um, and again, I think that's just a matter of education and time and identifying for the person with the person what shifts um, and getting them to notice that, that they may find that the, the consequences are painful. Um, I think that's, that's all I would say about it. Uh, that person could email me off offline. That would be fine. Okay, thank you. And I think we have time for one last question. And someone wanted to uh, ask, and perhaps you can clarify, were you saying that a person with bipolar disorder cannot be in attachment love or companion love? No, no, not at all. No, I was not, not saying that at all. I'm only, only talking today about the similarities between the state of love and the state of being uh, hypomanic or manic. Um, this is just something that, it, that captures my imagination, that, that they have so much in common and that they're part of the creative expansion of the universe, uh, that we have these up expansive states. And it's interesting to see how much they have in common and wonder why that might be. Um, no, not, not at all. Um, all of us settle into a more or less companion or com long-term kind of love, including bipolar people. Okay, thank you so much. This was really informative and a very, very interesting topic. So we really appreciate your time and being with us today. You're welcome. And let me just show my email on screen if people want to get in contact with me. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you all for listening. I'd be very interested in your feedback. This is kind of a new area of thinking about these two things as having something in common. We did a panel on it at the International Bipolar Meeting this year, and it was the first such sort of comparison. So very interested in your feedback, and thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.